Namaskar and welcome back to Aviation Avico where you feel the most alive. ICAO NX14 Chapter 3 is where the real design of an airport comes alive. This chapter is all about physical characteristics, the rules that decide how runways, taxiways, aprons, strips, shoulders and the RESA are laid out and maintained. In this chapter, we will focus on the runway, its length, width, slope and even how parallel runway are supposed to be spaced. Step by step, we will move on to taxiways, apron, other essential features that make an aerodrome safe and efficient in the further parts of the video on physical characteristics. So let us start with the heart of the airport, the runway. The backbone of aerodrome design is adherent to its physical characteristics. This chapter specifies what are the requirements for designing a runway, taxiway, apron, strip, shoulder, resa, clearway and stopway. It specifies the number, sighting and orientation of the runway including how they should be designed in order to ensure a given usability factor. We will look into the specific terms in further slides. But we get the concept that this chapter will tell us what should be the length of the runway, what should be the width of the runway. Further, moving on, we'll understand why are there slopes given on these runways, what makes the runways usable even during adverse weather conditions. It helps us understand the limit of slopes, the longitudinal and the transverse slope. That is the slope of the runway surface, that is longitudinal slope and the transverse slope. What makes runways safe even during adverse weather conditions and various operational conditions? Further, what is the minimum separation required between two parallel runways? Let's say these two runways are parallel. What is the minimum separation required between these two runways? What is the dimension of runway and safety areas? Further, in case these two runways are staggered, in that case, what is the distance that is supposed to be there between these two parallel runways. In the further slides, we will understand each of these specifications in detail. Number 1. Runway Physical Characteristics The number and orientation of runways at an aerodrome shall be such that the usability factor of the aerodrome is not less than 95% for the aeroplanes that the aerodrome is intended to serve. What this basically means is that the airports must design and orient their runways so that they can be used safely at least 95% of the time by aircraft they are intending to serve. This is calculated based on the wind conditions at the aerodrome. Now, there is a limit on crosswind component. If the wind blows across the runway, that is, if the wind is blowing at an angle with respect to the runway, this makes it difficult to take off or land and this is called the crosswind. Now, it is assumed that aircrafts can fly safely up to a particular crosswind component. It should be presumed that landing or takeoff of aeroplanes is in normal circumstances precluded when the crosswind component exceeds a given ARFL. What is ARFL? ARFL is a minimum field length required for takeoff and is calculated under these ideal conditions, which are number one, aircraft is at its maximum certified takeoff mass. Number two, the runway is at sea level, that is, there is no impact of altitude. Number three, the weather condition is standard atmosphere. Number four, the wind is calm, that is, there is no headwind or tailwind. Number five is the runway is flat, that there is no impact of slope, up or upward or downward slope. So given these ideal conditions, there is a defined field length of the runway that is required for an aircraft to take off. This length is given in the aircraft flight manual and it is provided by the manufacturer. Before we look at this table, let us understand what is crosswind component. Let us consider wind is blowing at an angle with respect to this runway and this is the direction of takeoff or landing. Or let us look at this figure. This is the direction of takeoff or landing and wind is blowing at a particular angle. Now, if we take the component of this particular wind direction in the perpendicular axis with respect to the direction of takeoff or landing, this component, this perpendicular component of wind is called the crosswind component and we are concerned about this component here. Now, if the ARFL given for a particular aircraft is 
greater than or equal to 1500 meters. In that case, the limit to the crosswind component is 37 km per hour. Similarly, if the ARFL is greater than or equal to 1200 meters but less than 1500 meters, in that case, the limit to the crosswind component is 24 km per hour. Further, if, if the ARFL given for the aircraft is less than 1200 meters, in that case, the limit to the crosswind component is only 19 km per hour. Now, these limits are considering normal circumstances. But what happens if there is poor runway braking action that is owing to the insufficient longitudinal coefficient of friction? In that case, we further reduce this crosswind component tolerance of 37 km per hour in this case of a, in a given case of ARFL to further 24 km per hour because with a poor braking action on the runway and an aircraft being pushed by the wind in a given direction, the landing can be made unsafe. So we limit the allowable component of crosswind from 37 km per hour to 24 km per hour when the ARFL is greater than or equal to 1500 meters. So I hope we have understood with this how runways are oriented and how many runways are required at an aerodrome. Everything is done in order to ensure that the aerodrome is usable not less than 95% of the aeroplanes that the aerodrome is intending to serve. Look at the location of runway thresholds. A threshold shall normally be located at the extremity of the runway unless operational conditions justify a choice of another location. When it is necessary, we displace a threshold either permanently or temporarily from its location and we shall take into account various factors before we determine the location of our new threshold. Now, when the then when this threshold is displaced due to unserviceable runway condition, a clear and graded area of at least 60 meter in length shall be available between the unserviceable area and the displaced threshold. Like we know that a distance of 60 meter shall be available from the end of the runway or the stopway as the runway strip. So this clear and graded area should be available between the new location of our threshold and the unserviceable area. Further, we should also consider that Beyond this 60 meters, further at least 90 meters or as recommended 240 meters of race are shall be available for a code 3 or 4 runway. The actual length to be provided for a primary runway shall be adequate to meet the operational requirements for aeroplanes for which the runway is intended and it shall be not less than the longest length determined by applying the corrections for local conditions to the operations and performance characteristics of the relevant aeroplane. Now, the primary runway length that you can see here or the main runway length, it shall be as per the requirement of the aeroplane that is intending to take off or land at this particular runway. Corrections based on the local operating conditions, let's say the temperature, the prevalent wind conditions, the slopes, the altitude etc. should be considered while determining the length of the primary runway. Further, similarly, the secondary runway design shall also be considering those factors as we considered for the design of primary runway and it needs only to be adequate for those aeroplanes which will be using the secondary runway in addition to the other runways or runway in order to obtain a usability factor of 95%. Now, while designing the secondary runway also, we consider those same factors that we have considered for on primary runway, but we, there may be conditions in which we limit the aircraft that will be operating on the secondary runway or the secondary runway is being built to ensure the usability factor of the aerodrome is not less than 95%. So, considering these factors, we determine the length of the secondary and primary runways. Now that we have understood the length of the runway, let us look at the width of the runway and it shall be determined using this table as you can see here. It is dependent on the code number of the runway and the outer main gear wheel span of the aircraft that is intending to use that particular runway. Now outer main gear wheel span is the distance between the outer main gear wheels of the main landing gear. Now, aircrafts can have a uh, outer main gear wheel span up to but not including 4.5 meters. There is maximum of outer main gear wheel span of 9 meter up to but not including 
15 meters. So as the outer main gear wheel span increases and the code number increases, the width of the runway required also increases. If we compute from this table, the outer main gear wheel span and the code of the runway that is required for these particular aircrafts you see in the image. We see that the runway width requirement for all these aircrafts is 45 meters. But with such a big aircraft that is Airbus 380 as compared to a 737, the runway width requirement is still of 45 meters. How do we compensate for these wings, the outer wings of this Airbus 380 going out of the runway for a similar to the case of Boeing 747. This is compensated by giving a greater or wider dimensions of runway shoulder here. We will look into this particular detail in the next presentations where we understand that how can we accommodate bigger aircraft even on the same runway of 45 meters. The width of the runway that you mostly will see at aerodromes where commercial aircraft operations takes place is 45 meters because the runway is intended to serve an aircraft having an outer main gear wheel span of 9 meter up to but not including 15 meters and the code number of that associated runway is 4 meters so when you look at this table the required width of the runway becomes 45 meters now that we have understood that an aerodrome can have more than one runways in order to ensure a usability factor of 95% or in order to accommodate more traffic, what should be the minimum separation between two runways in case they are parallel or near parallel, which means near parallel runways are the ones whose extended runway centerline have an angle of convergence of divergence of 15 degree or less. What should be the separation between these two runways? Now, this is dependent on the type of operations that we are intending to have on these runways. Let us assume that these runways are instrument runways. In that case, for independent parallel approaches, that means approaches on these two instrument runways that are parallel or near parallel, in case approaches are being made simultaneously to these parallel or near parallel instrument runways. And the radar separation minima between these two aircrafts are not prescribed. We require a greater spacing between these two runways, uh, these two runway extended runway center lines in order to ensure safety and that distance is 1035 meters. In case the radar separation minima between these two aircrafts is prescribed, in that case we can reduce the distance between the two runway extended center line a little and it will come down to 915 meters. In case there is independent parallel departures from these two runways, that is there is simultaneous de departures from these two runways, in that case the minimum spacing between the runways should be 760 meters. Further. If there is segregated parallel operations, what we mean by that is that there is simultaneous operations on this parallel or near parallel instrument runways in which one runway is exclusively used for approaches and the other is exclusively used for departures. Then that case, the spacing between the runway should be 760 meters. This is the distance that is required between two runways or two runway extended center line in order to ensure safety of aircraft operations. From the previous slide, we know that for segregated parallel operations, the minimum spacing between the two extended runway center line should be 760 meters. This is in case the thresholds start from the same point with respect to an arriving aircraft. Now, let us assume in this photo, this runway that is there, it is used only for departures while this runway is used only for arrival. So, this is a seg a runway used for segregated parallel operation and ideally if the threshold started from the same point in that case the distance between these two center lines should be 760 meters but in this case with respect to an arriving aircraft the arrival runway is staggered 150 meters away from the arriving aircraft in this case the separation between these two extended runway center line should be increased by another 30 meters that is the distance should be 790 meters but in case this runway was staggered towards the arriving aircraft by another 150 meters suppose the runway started runway threshold was over here it started from this location in that case the distance between the two runway ex extended runway center line 
should be decreased by 30 meters. Now we have come to the slopes on the runway. This is the slope that is along the runway center line. Now, the longitudinal slope is computed by dividing the difference between the maximum and the minimum elevation along the runway center line by the length of the runway. And this shall not exceed a slope of 1% where the code number is 3 or 4, which we see in most of the runways. Further, the longitudinal slope changes cannot be avoided. Sometimes the characteristic of the runway may be such that we cannot avoid such changes. In that case, the slope changes between the two consecutive slopes shall not exceed 1.5% for code 3 or 4 runway. Now let us look at transverse slope. To promote the most rapid drainage of water, the runway surface shall if practicable be cambered. That means the runway, runway that is given here should be cambered. It should have slope on either side of the center line in order to ensure drainage of water. Except where a single cross fraud from high to low in the direction of the wind most frequently associated with the rain would ensure rapid drainage. So basically the motive of transverse slope is to ensure that there is rapid drainage of water. So it can the runway surface can either be cambered or the slope between the highest and the lowest shall be such that there is no stagnation of water on the runway. Now, ideally, the slope shall be 1.5% where the code letter of the aircraft using the runway is C, D, E or F and 2% when the runway is being used by an aircraft having a code letter A or B. So, we have understood with this video the dimensions or the physical characteristic associated with transverse slopes. Thank you for watching this video. With this, we have understood the physical characteristics associated with the runway. Uh, we will be talking about the runway shoulders, the strip, the resa in our upcoming videos. I hope you enjoyed this video. The video was prepared by Shantanu and myself jointly. I hope you enjoyed this video and we could bring value. If you like our work, do not forget to like, share and subscribe because your support is our motivation. This is Anvesha Pal signing off. Thank you.